everybody to the JR Wisdom channel. I want to thank you guys for tuning back in. New and old subscribers, thank you guys, thank you guys, thank you guys. Can't thank you enough. Well, without further ado, you know, I'm happy I'm back in classic uh, view here, as opposed to if you haven't caught my, my live streams before. Well, today, as I promised, I'm going to be talking about, uh, as usual, the ever controversial topic, and you probably say, Jerry, why are you always talking about the church and these pastors and, you know, they're doing this and doing that? You know, as I've heard in the comments, that's none of my business. Well, I'm going to talk about it anyway. So, in this video, I'm going to be discussing, you know, about the, the evolution of the church. You know, whether you want to say the black church or whatever. Uh, and this is definitely within the, the African diaspora in America, the African American diaspora of the, the, the Christian church within America and the origins. And this is all due to, due to the recent, you know, tomfoolery that's been going on in the church, you know, the con men, people being swindled out of their hard earned money. And a lot of these things that is are going on, these wayward pastors or these rogue pastors, is causing a lot of the the flock to uh, withdraw from the church. And you know, a lot of the the parishioners. It's hard enough nowadays for you know men to patronize, and I use that word patronize a church. You know, black men to patronize a church. You know more more so than uh, females than women patronizing the church, which a lot of the pastors in in churches play to the the psyche of a lot of uh, the women, the black women within the church. So this these guys tend to take advantage of these women with verses, with their material possessions. And the fact that they will say, some of them, or some people believe that they are so close to God at that point. So I think at this this time, to fit this, you know, as Samuel L. Jackson says in Pulp Fiction, a verse that sort of fits this occasion. You know, Ezekiel twenty five seventeen, which this isn't actually a verse, he's kind of paraphrasing it in the movie, but he's putting it you know, more so fitting, and this is fitting to those who are trying to do, live a righteous life and things of that nature, and he goes on in Samuel L. Jackson, for those of you who have seen Pulp Fiction, and he says, the path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. Blessed is he whom in the name of charity and goodwill shepherds the weak through the valley of darkness, for he is truly his brother's keeper and the finder of lost children. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who attempt to poison and destroy my brothers. And you will know that my name is the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon thee. So, Just to dwell in that made up verse, which is it, it, it was very fitting and it was very biblical in nature. How, you know, those who struggle to be righteous as opposed to those who are supposed to be righteous in the position behind the pulpit, leading the flock, you know. But they take advantage of their position and they either use it in ways that are evil, you know. When they're supposed to be shepherding, be that shepherd for their flock. Those who are going through issues, those who are going through problems. Many of these women might be going through issues and they're taking advantage of them. So, that's I just wanted to <laughs> say that little verse real quick. But, for the past 10 years, you know, within the church, the black church in the, in the U.S., it has tripled and made over $400 million. Probably more than that. That's a figure that I came across. And this goes back from the evolution of the hooping and hollering preacher, you know, 
putting on an electrifying, dynamic experience. And it has always been a must in black churches, which we see to this day. High-pitched singing, Holy Ghost trials, choir singing, pianos and organs resonating sonically through the entire church. Then we got the praise dancing, which is, you know, something fairly new. I would like to, you know, because I don't remember when I was going to, going to church when I was a youngster seeing praise dancing and all this stuff. You just seen the Holy Ghost acrobatics that was going on in the church. So a lot of this stuff is innovation and wasn't practiced by Jesus Christ, as we know. So, but I know a lot of you guys are upset or going to be upset watching this video and I'm going to be talking cash-ish in my comment section, but that's cool. I like to hear that as well. So a lot of this stuff is in innovation, as you know. And that's cool. If it motivates you, you know, go for it. You know, as long as it's in good taste. But we know the pastor, he always appears, you know, to be the best dress or should be the best dress. And he's perceived to be a leader, if not the pillar of the community. Uh, within the black community, black church. And back in the day, the origination of the pastor, if you didn't know, is he was the closest to the master, the slave master, so to speak. And nowadays, he's looked at as anointed and the closest to God. And many people feel this way. And that's why they want their pastor looking the best, being the best, by all means. And they adorn the pastor as such. Some of these pastors, these men and women, they even go as far as, you know, calling themselves prophets, which is uh, way too far, in my opinion. That's too strong for my taste when you get to the point where you're calling yourself prophet and prophetess and all of these things, which is more innovation with these names. So within the, within the community... In a lot of the videos I've done, you see a lot of these many women, even when they're married, they desire these men. And he is perceived, even going back to uh, slavery, he's perceived as a man of means and power due to his immediate uh, proximity to the master. You know, and even now, they look at him due to his perceived proximity to God. He's the closest thing to God at this point. So, in return, like I said, the pastor and a lot of churches play on women's emotions and what women are going through. So, he in return provides a full narrative through sermons that speak directly to women. Single women and married women. And this is done through simping and a lack of accountability you know, for women saying it's his fault or it's everyone else's fault and not the woman's fault. You know, and he also promises that future of prosperity and God sending them potentially a man and potentially that man is the pastor, you know, their way, which will be changing their lives. So he keeps that inkling of hope via God and he might be the one to be able to bring them closer to God, so to speak. So, and this, this man is going to come to them without them having to change their ways, you know, and this is, this is preached a lot of times, a woman, this man, this perfect man will be sent to this woman without her having to change her ways, you know. So these pastors have incredible mouthpieces, which they use on single women and mothers, which is their bread and butter for the church. I know a lot of this is difficult to hear and listen to, and I know a lot of you probably cursing at your screen, your phone, at me, and saying I'm a liar and all that good stuff, but it's cool. Let me hear it in the comments instead of cursing at the screen and all that good stuff. So the, their bread and butter is the single women and mothers, and uh, those are the main parishioners of the flock. A lot of these pastors, these folks are animated, and they perform what I like to call a mini concert. And the pastor is normally the headliner for this concert. The deacon, from what I've seen throughout my life, the deacon is usually the open act. As well as they have, you know, 
other uh, opening acts before the pastor comes in. And they all sit on their thrones, you know, waiting at this point for their turn. So the deacon is the opening act, like I said, and you have the drums in the choir doing the interlude <laughs> with the collection plate, you know, passing around, you know, in frequent rotation in these churches. So this has become a great part of fellowship, which, you know, you putting on a show, I like to call it a pep rally, it's motivational, you know, but then I get into the point where from the motivation, which pep rally is cool, bringing up someone's spirits. If you can't find motivation from anywhere else and you feel like you can get it from church, by all means go. But this has become a great place to fellowship. You, you can hear an uplift, uh, uplifting word, you know, to lift your spirits. And parishioners there, you know, they hold on to every single word that the pastor says and they receive his interpretation. This also goes back to slavery as the pastor was one of the only ones that could read at the time. So women these days, despite over time, you know, it's become a fashion show as well. The clothing gets tighter and tighter, you know, and we see more club attire being worn to church with stilettos to church, you know, breasts is hanging out, you know, you can see the woman's, you know, backside, you can see her ass, you know, firm. This is even customary. We see a lot of this at funerals as well. Women dress this way. And it, and it's crazy. You you come to church to worship and pray and a man can't have a sane thought or a prayer. And I hate to keep going back to the man, you know, on this, but I'm just saying if you're trying to attract the man, you know, I I see, but there's other ways. You know, you if you're trying to attract the man like that, then you know he's only after one thing, sisters. So, a man can't have a sane thought during prayer without lustful thoughts of seeing a woman dressed in club attire. You know, it's a house of prayer, not a house of sex. A man can't pray with a heart on. It's just not right. These are things to think about. Over time, since this independent inception, back to Baptist and a AME, African Methodist, Methodist Episcop Episcopal, whatever you want to call it, churches, it was quickly determined that um, the preacher game was a profitable profession, which many men still take advantage of, and women to this day. Pay for prayer, collection plates, and making people feel guilty for not giving their money to Almighty God. This has led to many gullible people being duped out of their money and their homes. You know what I'm saying? The gift of gab is incredible, people. You know, and many of those people who attend seminary school and they learn the truth of certain things, they uh, still proceed with this whole, you know, way of life in hopes of getting rich. You know, vanity is become more prevalent. I talk about this a lot in my videos and we th we see it through the style of dress, the, the jewelry, the cars, the gold, even the way some of these churches are built is not modest. So... I get a lot of comments, people saying, well, celebrities can do it. Why can't preachers do it? And they're completely just missing the point. So, you know, I, I, I can't explain it. I, isn't it obvious, you know, you're, you're a celebrity as opposed to a preacher. A celebrity has their flock of people who they, who they, these fans, but a preacher is there to keep people you know, bring them to God, you know, so people have argued with me and they argue with other people saying, well, I should be able to live like a celebrity. I should be able to have this, not saying that you can't, but you have to lead by example, especially when these guys are having sex with women, you know, tricking off on stuff, being vain and stuff like that. So I just want to make this quick video just to bring about that point for something to look at is, you know. Is it a pep rally? Is that what church has turned into? And a den of thieves? Or is it really a beacon of hope? You know, or is it just something to do on a Sunday that you're just required to because of your parents? So, just food for thought. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, if I offended you, you know, hey, you know, just, just comment it and let me know. It's no problem. 
you know, like like the video if you don't mind. Share, subscribe, share it with everyone else, you know, that you come across if you don't mind. Um, follow me on social media. Check me out on Amazon. Throw a couple coins in the well of wisdom. I don't have a collection plate. And I'll catch you guys on the next video. Be, be sure to check out my other videos and subscribe. Hit the bell for all notifications so you receive all my new content. And I appreciate you guys once again. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, I'll see you on the next one, guys. Or the Sunday Sermon if you guys tune into the live. So, see you then. Peace.